Professor Kevin Nugent. Kevin is founder and director of the Brazelton Institute in the Children's Hospital Boston, and he is a faculty member of the Harvard Medical School. More importantly, I think Kevin has collaborated in research concerning infant mental health for over 35 years. He has contributed to international journals and meetings. He has contributed not only to our understanding as a community of psychologists, but to the wider understanding of the importance of the early years. Kevin's work has been fundamental in influencing the direction of psychology in its understanding of the first three years of life. We got to know each other recently and shared in common and a love of the line from T.S. Eliot, it said, in my beginning is my end. Yesterday morning was my proudest moment as former, at the time, president uh, of PSI. It was my proudest moment. Professor Nugent dressed the Oireachtas Joint Health Committee. So doing, placed what we know, what we know as psychologists, onto the political agenda. It was a privilege to watch Kevin translate psychological research to a political audience, to do that with skill and engagement. It is an enormous privilege to have Kevin with us. We spoke yesterday about infant mental health as everybody's responsibility. It is not the responsibility of psychologists. It is everybody's responsibility. And the failure to provide services is simply unacceptable and is costing us far too much. It's my privilege to welcome Kevin, to welcome him home. That was for cruel to you. It's more on an only. It's a great honor. So, I feel very privileged to be here with you and my colleagues to talk about infant mental health, to share with you some of the ideas that my colleagues and I, over the last, yes, 35 or more years, working at Boston Children's Hospital and Harvard Medical School, and collaborating with many colleagues here at home in the countries around the world, to learn more about the the inner world of infants. And Paul put it beautifully yesterday when he said at the end of the hearing, he said, infant mental health is everybody's business. And I feel for us as psychologists, I've always felt privileged to be there at any moment in time when in fact, you are written into the family story. By virtue of the fact you're at a very transformative moment in people's lives. If you're there in a way that's non-judgmental, affirmative, non-didactic, allowing people to grow into their own skins as parents, we can make an impact that has long-lasting effects. Sure, you have it in your clinical practice every day, but somebody comes to you in the street and says, God, I remember the day that you did such a thing, and it can be so affirming for us. Yesterday, with Paul, we sat before the hearing. I have to tell you, it was a, a very proud moment in my life uh, to speak to legislators, because I think for psychologists like us, and Paul masters this, and I'm sure Anne will too, bridging the gap between research and practice and public policy is something we haven't done very, very well. We've all been in our, I can speak for myself, our own silos, but to reach out and translate this to politicians, policy makers, and align ourselves, and align ourselves with their motivations, I think this is one thing we can, it's a privilege to do. Jean, please. Dean, you've always been valued as a psychologist and as an AV man, I can tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> the point I made yesterday I'd like to share with you today, it's my grandson, <laughs> who I'm very proud to say has got the name of Inba. <laughs> the patron saint of, of Inishmore, I think.
Thanks for your patience. Thanks very, very much. The theme yesterday and the theme today is that the first three years of life are a time of massive brain development, which have, which have lifelong implications for the child and for society. And as Paul said yesterday, infant mental health is everybody's business. So the foundations of am I still with you? Yes. <laughs> the foundations of sound mental health are built early in life, built on early experiences, experience with parents, caregivers, relatives, teachers, peers, brothers and sisters, as they interact with genes to create the architecture of the human brain. During the first three years of life, children's long-term capacities to think, to trust, to feel concerned for others, to understand, are being fundamentally shaped. Let me begin with this small, short video clip by Felix Warnikin, who's a colleague of ours now, but at this time was in Leipzig in Germany. Perhaps a clip you've seen, where you see a toddler, 18 month old, with a mother in a lab setting. Without any instruction, they're sitting there. Just take a close look. Eighteen months. Think of it. A year ago, he was taking his first. Eighteen eight months ago, he was taking his first step. Six months ago. Now look at the confident gait, balance, coordinated across the room. His eye hand coordination. He reaches out and pulls the door open. Think of his cognitive development, way beyond object permanence. He knows what he can categorize. He knows presses or stuff you put stuff into. He knows the opposite of the stuff inside. Books go in there. Incredible array of problem solving capacity at this stage and a theory of mind to boot. He could read what was in this man's mind. He needed help. And like, unlike adults, like me, he delivers. He was already helps. He opens, the, he opens the door. Talk about things, capacity for empathy, for generosity. And the point I make is, 18 months, how could we ever underestimate this 18 month older? His orientation towards life is already fundamentally shaped towards people, places, the environment, exploration. By the time he reaches kindergarten, he's already well on his way. If he isn't, a lot of water has run under the bridge, and we have a chance to be there as that is being generated, as the brain is creating its own architecture, because the architecture is created by the caregiving environment. So children who give this support thrive. Children who don't, the brain suffers, and they suffer. And there's a lifelong burden on the shoulders trying to make up for the time they lost in these early years. So skills such as empathy, for us I call civility, executive function planning, resilience, persistence, are essential for later learning, for success, the ability to form healthy relationships in life. And these skills make the difference really between negative and positive outcomes in life. Simply stated, as a start for the presentation, establishing successful relationships with adults and other children provide the foundation and capacities that infants will use for a lifetime. So I'd shift particularly, emphasize, I'd say, the parents of the caregiving role, they need not be parents, but the people who 
critical in this child's life, whatever the culture. Because they, it is, that provide a foundation, or they provide a foundation for self-confidence, security, emotional stability, and readiness to learn. So in general, what we've learned over the last few years, and I'm new to this because I began off knowing a little, un underestimating what babies can do. I'm sure you like me. I, I think also we, perhaps we, not very few in this room, some exceptions, can remember much explicitly of the first three years of their lives. So we assume that maybe it wasn't important after all. Or if we see children stressed out in the first experience of childcare, daycare, in school, we just, oh, they get over it. They're resilient. Kids can bounce back. Nobody believed that children could have mental health problems, that toddlers could have mental health problems. We assumed they'd bounce back. Fortunately, the field of infant mental health has told us that that's such a mistake. Children can be burdened, can be depressed. I spoke yesterday of a six-week-old baby I saw who had all the symptoms of clinical depression. But they're all dramatic because I met this baby on day one of his life. He was bright as a proverbial button. Alert, responsive, good tone. And I remember saying to the students with me, God, this baby has got such a good start in life. That's all I can do. We don't know what he's going to be like at 21. But today, he's ready, almost biologically ready to engage the world, to join the world, because he was such a social little boy, could track, gaze, look back. At six weeks, because he was placed for adoption, sadly, he was a different baby. He was lethargic, dull, unresponsive, crying, fussing, unable to be. Within the six months, he'd begun to internalize a model of the world that's been not there for him. His biological expectations to be held, to be talked to, to be loved, had been violated. By six weeks, he recognized his behavioral responses suggested. He had recognized this disruption, this violation of his biological expectation. Of course, fortunately, the game is not over. We have a chance to help him back. And that's why intervention in the early years is so critical. We can bring him back in the context of a new relationship. The relationship will give him the sense that he is valued, he is loved, he is unique, he is special, he is something. He can, in fact, and this is the point I'm going to make in the second part of my presentation, the baby or the child can be the therapeutic agent in our lives. By placing the baby, the child, in the center of our therapeutic endeavors, the baby actually has the curative function of drawing the best out of parents, because at some deep level, parents want to make it work with their babies. However, we have labeled that mother or father, drug use, in prison, whatever it's been, they have a chance, as, as Selma Freiberg said, for a psychological rebirth. And we can be part of that. But luckily, it's not depending on us. It depends on the way we can, if you like, draw out the best in the baby. In a really strength-based model, which labels nobody, makes no assumptions about these parents when they come to us, but allows the baby to tell them, this is who I am, this is what I need, and that's our goal. Let me take a brief look at this small piece of film that my colleague Jack Shonkoff made to show, if you like, how it all works. This little fellow. Sorry. It's called neurons. Send electrical signals to communicate with each other. These connections form circuits that become the basic foundation of brain architecture. Circuits and connections proliferate at a rapid pace and are reinforced through repeated use. Our experiences and environment dictate which circuits and connections get more use. Connections that are used more grow stronger and more prominent. Meanwhile, connections that are used less fade away. 
this process, neurons form strong circuits and connections for emotions, motor skills, behavioral control, logic, language, and memory during the early critical period of development. With repeated use, these circuits become more efficient and connect to other areas of the brain more rapidly. While they originate in specific areas of the brain, the circuits are interconnected. You can't have one type of skill without the others to support it. Like building a house, everything is connected, and what comes first forms a foundation for all that comes later. As you can see, and the point I'd like to make, the newborn at birth has all the brain cells more or less he'll need for the rest of his life. But through experience, these neurons specialize and begin to connect and organize into functional systems beginning in pregnancy. The brain size member doubles in the first year. And by the end of the third year, it has reached 80 to 90% of its adult volume. But more interesting for me is that in these first years of life, every single moment, the 70, between 700 and 1,000 neural connections are formed every second as the brain builds the connections to synapses, more than is taking place in our brains at this moment. And that's the whole process of pruning that Jack spoke of in the film. So remember the next time you look at a, when you go home tonight and look at any under three, look them in the eye, or look them in the eye, and begin to play and say, Gucci Goo, I like you. <laughs> that 700 to 1,000 neurons have been sparked in that moment. And these are positive sparks that even though you may not remember, and he or she may not explicitly remember, but the whole reinforcement of these values will last for a lifetime. It gives the child a sense of, I am, as Erickson might say, trustworthy, worthy of trust, worthy of love. I am valued. So our responsivity, of course, and sensitivity are really the hallmarks of, of this whole endeavor. We also remember that children who spend longer time in adverse environments, the recovery is much more difficult. Children exposed to abuse, neglect, children without supportive adult relationships. These really affect brain functioning and impairing cell growth. And I'd like to say that even though the newborn period makes up the early months, even three after the first three years, for all of you who work with adults, and the first three years must seem a very minor part of life in terms of the whole lifespan, I'm going to take it a step further and take the first three months of life as being actually critically important for us as people who want to make a difference in the lives of families. Because this short period, from pregnancy to the end of the first three or four months of life, involve a pivotal series of life-changing events in the child, as he moves from the intrauterine to the extrauterine life. For the parents, they move from being a non-parent or a parent of a previous child to a parent of a new child, developing a new relationship with a particular child. And for the family, it's changed irrevocably. For the boundaries of the members of the family, is trying to retain some kind of stability, continuity, and yet incorporate this new member. And siblings, the most undervalued of all, their lives have changed immeasurably. So failing to include siblings in this endeavor is missing out on some of the great change agents in this little child's life, don't you think? As psychologists, I often feel that they're surely most neglected people in every textbook we've seen, the role of siblings. That we focus so much on parents, okay, and hopefully grandparents, but we forget about the siblings. So I'm just going to make, the, I, I love this Picasso picture because it's both tender and by God is it strong. So the first three months of life involve this major transformation of many neural functions. The brain is sparkling like the dickens from the world go, from the word go. But also in his efforts to adapt to his or her new environment. How can we monitor, measure that, pr uh, observe the process with the parents in this collaborative way? Uh, but for the parents, too, it's a huge moment in their relationship. And as I said, even if they had a difficult relationship with a previous baby, a previous child, this is a new one, a different one. So we make no assumptions. So when the resident says to me, Kevin, this mom is a huge, she's got a, a user and she's been in prison, I find that interesting but unimportant. I want to find, over time, maybe this will become more interesting, but I want to find out who this little baby is. And I can draw the very best of the baby to, if you like, translate into her life. So it is, in many ways, a period of great vulnerability for the baby. In cultures around the world, after all, life and death are at stake with birth. And in the case of a very high-risk infant, it's still a touch-and-go event. So it's a period of vulnerability, certainly, and as parents face it, 
nobody here who's gone through it could ever say, I went through that with great confidence. One is put to the test, if you like, in terms of one's capability of reaching out to people to do in their uh, person. But it's a unique opportunity for us as clinicians, it seems to me. A, a teachable moment par excellence. Not that we go there to teach, I, I would like to say that. It's not that we teach parents. The last thing our approach would suggest is you tell parents what to do. Uh, who would I be to say what parents should do? You have to allow them, as Winnicott said, let them go under their own skins as parents. And allow them to avail of their own cultural and species-specific capital. What's allowed parents to be decent parents to help their children survive for thousands of years. So I'd like first to take a look back, if, you're not too, if you don't get too hungry, you can, please, I hope I can read the cues by people about needs for, for lunch, but let me take it back a little bit. As an Irish person, I always felt in America, I kind of avoid looking back uh, to see where we come from. Americans said, let's get on the future, but I said, let's take a look back first. Because uh, in Boston, William James, the founder of psychology, those who have been there, the psychology department knows the, the William James building, he used this great phrase, the baby, become iconic, assailed by eyes, ears, nose, skin, entrails at once, feels it all as one great blooming, buzzing confusion. Confusion. And I think for most people, we assume that the baby was acting at a brain, brain stem level. I mean, you've seen the whack babies around the nurseries if they have no feelings. In fact, in the past, when I went uh, to work there first, people thought the baby is an it. As if the baby didn't have a, there was no person there. Take a look at this. On the left, yes, confused, buzzing, it must be. I think of the newborn baby, the, the noise, the lights coming out from the newborn, from, from the womb, and suddenly being faced with this incredible barrage of, of, and yet, 15 minutes later, actually it's about 30 minutes later, confused, not on your life. This baby will actually find that breast, work as well as Peter, many people that should open, work up to get that breast, and it's so darn focused, that nothing will stop that baby getting through the breast or trying to feed in these first few moments of life. And take a look up, who is this person in my life? What can I begin to, and then because everything is moving, in a very rapid moving movie, he or she wants to say, what can I rely on right here? What's permanent? So the struggle for the baby is to see, what is it I can trust in here? Lights, and of course it will be, we'll see later. When I went there first, well, that was a bit before that, I have to say, uh, Robert Vance was one of the pioneers in, at the University of Pennsylvania in visual responses. And he found out babies actually could see at birth. The idea that they could just see vague, foggish uh, sort of shadows was incorrect. And he gave them this little test, they're going to check a board and a very bland uh, sort of uh, stimulus. And of course, they preferred by far the checkerboard. Some business entrepreneurs went along and have sold these for families, to give you the impression these, I'm sure you have seen them, hanging, for, oh good God, I mean, it's an, almost incredible, it's the, the business world being so canny what to do. There was no, there was really no evidence that this does anything for your child. All he had was perhaps a, a checkerboard or a draft board in his lab, and a family, oh, the baby prefers the, the complex board. But of course, what we do know is that babies now have full visual capacity at birth, particularly with the range of the mother to the breast or the father to, to the child's face, 18 to 15 inches away. We refer to look at curves or the straight edges. And that we have special attention with it. Look at the little picture, I'll, I'll come back to it later, which is uh, part of the work that we do, the baby tracking the red ball. Can you see it up in the corner? I mean, look at the toes, the fingers, the nose, everything. After all, it's the first red ball this baby has seen. And that's the beauty of children. Not only are they empathic, but they've never seen this before. They're engaged in the world in a way that we consider, oh, we've seen this, we've been there before. Everything is new, fresh, and they're trying to build this into their, to their uh, worldview. But what do they prefer to look at? Now we know, given a choice, they prefer the human face looking at them. And we also know that they can recognize distinguishing expressions. Tiffany Field showed that they can distinguish between a smile from a surprise from a sad expression. So you can't pull the wool over a baby, a newborn baby's eyes. They're fine-tuned to figure out what this world is doing. So one doesn't talk about a baby in his or her presence, no one would talk about a friend in their presence to say, you know, oh, you're so well today, you look very tired. <laughs> Babies are there present at this stage. 
can they hear? Again, my first generation babies could hear. Bill Pfeiffer showed, of course, that they can, they can turn to the kid of sound. They responsive more so to voices than to actual uh, a pure tone. But I like the third bullet. I find the third bullet interesting. I'd like to understand it more. They're so fine-tuned. I'm talking about a newborn baby. They can detect a missing beat in the music pattern. I, I find this incredible. I've been trying my grandson, going like dee 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 dee, and then go dee dee dee, pull back the last note. <laughs> in other words, so fine tuned, you get the rhythms of life, the rhythm of the world, the rhythm of the language. So when Pfeiffer says babies can recognize their, if you like, their mother's voice or their father's voice, it's the recognized. Don't you assume from from in utero the cadences, the rhythms. Uh, they, they, and can identify that. And that's what I think this, this research seems to support. But really, what they prefer to listen to again is the parents' voices. And the whole the beginning of language. You remember that wonderful uh, new work about children being linguists of the world? Until eight months, children can understand any language. So that, having worked in Japan a lot, even Japanese linguists find it difficult to distinguish between an L and an R, between lounge and range. Japanese babies under eight, nine months. No trouble. Come to a year, they've lost the ability. They've been socialized into the language of their culture. But at this age, they're so fine-tuned to rhythms, they can pick up anything. Smell and touch, I won't go into too much, but you know, insofar as smell and touch contribute to the relationship, they're beautifully designed to draw in the mom, draw in the dad. And we know that, that the close physical contact, such as breastfeeding and ours, they allow an infant to grow in that bond between the parents, which is adaptive for the baby's survival and success. Taste. Same thing we won't go into. Imitation, I never give the time of day to this for a long time, the work of Andrew Meltzoff up in Seattle, because he found that babies could imitate facial expressions shortly after birth. But actually, all this new work on mirror neurons, suddenly we oh my god, now I see they can do it. So the work of by Rizalosi and Kavya at Padua showed us that babies actually can learn by observation. And the brain mechanisms that they are still clicked, uh, clicking into uh, uh, operating are the same as they do as if they were operating on the, on the actual behavior. So let's take a look at why it might be important. But this nice, nice little thing for all this, for all the da dads in the audience here. I hope I get that in. And the little sibling draws in there. Like. <laughs> so, as I said, I only value that. But it certainly, for me, it shows the, the capacity to learn, to pick up cues. And in this case, for the dad drawing into a game of interaction. So this, this imitation was the beginning of social interaction. So if you'd like to stick your tongue out at your child, that's fine. I, I used to think that was unusual, but that can be the beginning of a game. So we've learned that babies, certainly newborns particularly, in the first months, are more competent than we'd ever thought. And they're actually initiating the engagement, by the way. They're not waiting for adults. Heidi Al's wonderful work, my colleague, with premature babies in the NICU, shows that babies actually, they started off. So if the dad is reading the paper and the baby goes, uh, uh, he'd look up. And, okay, and they'd look back. But if the baby continues, he goes, are you okay? The baby is really eliciting, engaging uh, from the beginning. So actively constructing his or her own brain from the outset. One of the great inventions, that, at least discoveries, that I think was by, uh, I hope I can get this now. Alexa, six states of consciousness. State one is a deep sleep state. Characteristics include eyes fully closed, no eye movements under closed eyelids, regular respiration, no spontaneous activity except for sounds and sudden jerky movements. State two is a light sleep state. These behaviors are common in state two. The eyes are closed, but may briefly open from time to time. There's rapid eye movement under closed eyelids. Activity is minimal. There are random movements, and there is sucking on and off. 
Stage three is the drowsy state, when the baby transitions from sleep to wake. Indicators of stage three include semi nosing, heavy eyelids, variable activity, and smooth movements. Stage four is the quiet alert state. An infant in stage four shows a bright eyed look, an invested focus on the stimulus, and minimal motor activity. A baby in stage five is active and often fussy. Characteristics of stage five include open eyes, brief periods of fussiness, high motor activity, thrusting movements, and may have spontaneous startles. Finally, a baby in stage six is not happy. Signs of stage six include an intense cry and high motor activity. I really showed them because it must seem almost trite to you. But when these were discovered by somebody who might admire, and a good friend of mine, Peter Wolf, many years ago, a psychiatrist, it showed that baby's world was more organized than we'd ever thought. And the minute you see a baby asleep, you respect that. So you don't try to feed the baby or push the baby in. You, uh, these states demand respect. It's the baby say, excuse me, please, I'm sleepy. Is that okay with you? <laughs> so it's, in other words, we're in a world of physicians who come in and they, they will arouse that baby at any one time without ever asking the child's permission, so to speak. When I began to work in Boston all these years ago, I began to work with Barry Brasselton, and it was he who said, ah, but there's more to it. I know they can see, no idea. there's more to it than all that. You can actually tease out the baby's individuality from the word go. You can see the personality, and that's what I'd like to. And I've worked with him in trying to develop, if you like, strategies, assessment tools that can do that. So here's a short video that goes back to that particular time. 1973. I like that, that phrase, you can trust that language. And I believe I'm sort of running out of time, which is, uh, I mean, you're probably getting a bit hungry. So I'll condense the last 45 minutes into about three. <laughs> 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 I'm going to show that great, what we call a sort of an iconic picture, but I, I kind of like it so much. Uh, but we developed, I helped Barry develop the NBAS, which we was used in research studies around the world. But I discovered over all these years that parents were absolutely engaged in what I was doing. And they wanted to know more. They were hungry for information. So I, we developed with colleagues this newborn behavior observation system as a, a relationship building tool. And in a way, shifting the focus from assessment to relationship building. And it can be easily integrated into a clinical practice, either in the hospital, in a home visit, or in a clinic setting. But the goal is to sensitize parents to the baby's individuality uh, as a person, if you like, and to promote a positive relationship between parent and child. In a nutshell, it is. We use it to sensitize parents to the baby's cues, to read the language. I mean, babies can't talk, infants can't talk, but how do you make sense of it? To decode their language is our endeavor. And if you like, to establish a relationship of trust between baby and family and between you and the family. Because you have a promise of an ongoing relationship with the family over time. So we use this tool at birth up to the end of the third month of life. It's a very narrow window, of course. But the goal is to capture the baby, to give the baby a voice. So to stop things, so you go to a family, you say, okay. And at its best, you have the whole family there. Grandparents, godparents, and say, okay, let's give the baby center stage. Your role as a psychologist is very choreographer, set the stage. You have some maneuvers to do, but you become, in a way, the invisible person. The maneuvers don't appear. What appears really is the baby himself. You get the baby story and the family story at its best. So the parents have a chance to say, this is who we are. These are our concerns, and this is what we bring to the table. And the baby, too, can say, this is what I'm telling you about myself. I, this is very hard for me. Loud noises. Please don't put me sleeping in there. It's tough. I like me sleeping close to you. So the goal is to capture the baby's individuality from the beginning. Uh, this is myself in the neonatal intensive care unit at discharge. And again, I have to say this mother, the nurse told me never smiled for the first two months of her baby's life in the neonatal intensive care unit. At this moment, I asked her, I said, would you like to call your baby's name? And that's what happened. The baby turned, and it meant for her the beginning of a possibility, a possible relationship. This is indeed a person who's present there. No longer a premature baby with great respiratory difficulties, etc. This is my baby. We can get on together. 
And I, I think as Bowlby said beautifully before, it's forced for, for the survival of babies are so designed by nature, they beguile and enslave mothers. He forgot the fathers, of course. <laughs> but, <laughs> but this picture is a very simple picture. And I guarantee you this baby never smiled much. But simply the knowledge of the psychologist who it was a psychologist who highly sales, tucked in the baby's hands, held the baby's head, created an envelope of support and safety for that baby so that she could actually sit back and say, hey, look around and smile and engage the parents. Uh, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll just rush down to the very end then. Uh, yeah, I, I'll show you this one. I'll, I'll show you this beautiful piece. So here's what we'd like to say is that even though these moments of meeting, and Nadia Stern, uh, Dan Stern's wife, which coined this phrase of moments of meeting, that each parent wants this moment when they can actually begin to engage. They may be short, maybe just a few seconds, a minute if you're lucky, but they are transformative, and they're created conjointly. It's in the rhythmic back and forth between you and the baby, who, by the way, is internalizing a model of the world that's about give and take, about language, about relationships, about love. These are all the building blocks at this moment. So this is a little, a five-day-old uh, Australia film for a colleague of mine, Beulah Warren, who kindly let me look at it, Maya. But in a way, it talks about brain development and about uh, care. How you? Five days old. Even in a newborn, there are clear periods of intense concentration and social interaction. That's probably the best place to end my talk. That means they want some more. Um, they've, um, you're, you're not you're not reading the, the, uh, the feedback about food very well at all. Actually, you got that wrong. <laughs> Are there any questions? Maybe I, I put this one up here because it's equally poignant, uh, and the first one because this was a time when I was asked to look at this baby after the baby had been discharged from the neonatal intensive care unit, and uh, I did the the NBO, which is very much a collaborative side by side endeavor. And the invitation is not to say, uh, I'm going to examine your baby, rather to say, let's look at your baby together, see what she can tell us about herself. That's the language. In this case, I did so. And again, in this pivotal moment, the baby was alert. I said to the mother, would you like to call her name? And the baby turned, and this is what happened. And the photographer was there, caught that moment. What I didn't know, and the mother was so happy, she was quite, for me, it was a moment of grace. I said, my God, I'm lucky to be here at this moment. But then she told me, the baby actually had diagnosed of Down syndrome. And at this moment, all she saw was the trisomy 21 baby, the label. Suddenly she said, now I see a baby, a person, and I can have a relationship with this person. I've got a future together. And really, this is where I think hope and happiness and the future are balanced together. Uh, Seamus Heaney said a great point, point. We have a chance to bring hope and happiness together at this particular moment. For me, the privilege of being involved with families in these early days is you are there and you can actually fan that hope. And that's, I think, what happened here. And that's probably a, a nice uh, 
life, to have my last life. But any questions, I'd be very happy to answer them at this stage. And if anybody, yes, I think it. Yeah, because I just say first, thank you very much for your presentation. Full of open Ah, thanks very much. Thanks so much. Um, That's so beautiful. That's space, you, all the words that I would share with you. Yes, there are two ways that you can use this approach. Let's say if you're in a neonatal intensive care unit as a nurse, and more and more, there are people in the States called child life specialists, and I always assume many of them are psychologists, who are there, the moments are very, very brief, you're right. A parent comes in, you join the parent, look at the baby, it may only be a touch, a brief glimpse, even a cry. That becomes then the grist for the mill. Why does the baby cry? How can we help them settle? And that may be the only intervention you might use. And the same, of course, if you go to a family for a home visit. Uh, you may have to give up whatever agenda you have because the baby really writes the script for this. If the baby is alert and well, you're doing it. If he sleeps throughout your whole visit, then sleep. And the whole challenges of developing good sleep-wake patterns, day-night uh, day patterns becomes the, the, the discussion, if you like. So you take what you get. At its best, you begin when the baby's asleep, you, let's say you shake a rattle to see how does the baby protect himself from noise in the environment. Then you move along, look at the motor system. All the things are important for parents, the hand grasp. And dads will say, or some moms will say, God, he's so strong. And somebody will say, he really loves me. Now we know it's, it's a reflex, the which we would, but it's the attributions, the meaning making of parents is, are as important as that's what you bring to the table. So really you incorporate their perception into the whole visit. If the baby cries, then we say, I wonder how does it work with settle? And mom will say, I always do this. And we said, let's see if there's some other ways she might use. Or then when the baby becomes alert, we can have interactions. But then we're focusing on the subtle cues the baby uses to disengage. So for example, the baby is looking away. Now, some parents might say, oh God, he doesn't, he doesn't love me. But you can see in the context as the outsider, he's just overwhelmed. He just wants a break. Just give him time to come, and then he comes back and he's available again. So you're talking about the threshold of the baby for stimulation. And you're trying to make so individualized, you can say, this little boy likes it this way, but by gosh, when you do it this way, it, it really, you can see how upsetting it is. So you're trying to work with them in developing a caregiving regimen that's absolutely individualized to this baby. So you forget about what's written in the books. The only book around here is the baby who writes the book. So parents' books, uh, I think the, the, one, the last one I wrote, I said, I'm not giving any advice to parents. And some people wrote back and said, well, we need you to give. I, I said, no, I, I can't. Uh, that would be just inappropriate and uh, the kind of, well, more good to it. But the fact is the baby should be writing the story. So yes, uh, a long way around of saying, you're using snapshots, but can also have the full film. And if you're lucky, if you go into a house, you can often have a whole hour of observing that baby who's in control, in the driver's seat, telling us all what she needs. And we all come back, I think, with a sense of investment in that baby's future. We want to make things work for the baby. So the more we can get in, as I said, the siblings, I'd want a lovely picture somewhere. Yeah, that's right. That's what <laughs> the sibling here, my little baby brother. <laughs> so watching the baby. So that, how does that? Do you think we were spending a lot more money on resources for psychologists and other people to work with parents? So say for instance, the three days after birth, do you think that would pay off really? Because a lot of our resources go into when things go wrong and when children start having problems and all of these mental health difficulties and whatever that occurs. But if we were really putting our resources in at that very immediate moment of birth through to three months, so months. Say, that would really in the end be convinced that the other end of the 
And certainly that, that's our thinking, I must say. But the, the challenge to us is to give the evidence for that. Recently, a study that I did with colleagues, which I was very happy about, we were able to reduce postpartum depression symptoms. And for me, that was important because postpartum depression can really, it's the dark, uh, it's a dark glass. And if you can really relieve that or reduce that, it's a huge contribution. And the same by enhancing the relationship, helping parents become tuned in. We can say it sets the stage for the future. Obviously, as psychologists, we've got to be engaged across the lifespan and across the full three years. I'm saying this is just the first step, but it may well be the intervention point par excellence. And I think when I was brought up in Mullingar, the midwife who delivered me became part of my family history. You always knew her, and you were five women, and she was the woman. So she's part of your history. And in a way, you are becoming part of the family history. Every culture has allo parents, godparents. And I think psychologists in today's isolated world, people are hungry for you to be there as a, somebody who validates them, who reframes their observations. Oh no, he's not looking away. You can see he's, uh, whatever. Or the mother who says, my baby isn't cuddly, he's rejecting me. I hold the baby, he's stiff as a poker. That's just the way he is. So it's reassuring for the mother and dad to say, it's not that he just doesn't like being held by you. At this stage, he's just very tonic. And we're just going to have to wait till we find other ways of making him feel at home than the, sort of the, the, the body language. Thanks very much. Yeah, but well said. And I would like to add that uh, since I know, since I'm tuned in every day, the homelessness being such a key issue, we have a project with healthcare for the homeless, and that is actually the goal. That even in these very fragile settings, we're there to get the mother to use your language, psychological space, uh, to really begin to really get to know their baby, and we're there providing that kind of envelope. So, yes, in cases of particularly poverty, or all the other, the cumulative risk factors that really make the thing so darn difficult. Uh, we are there, but again, and that's Paul's view, which I really admire, you've got to go the public policy route. It's got to be, the, the, it's not supporting individual families, it's the whole community, the whole culture that has to really uh, be brought back in serving the needs of parents and not blaming parents. So that's the whole thing, and I, I love what you say. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You're so, very you're so um, welcome. Encouraging and impressive. Um, my, I was just a bit about putting an example on, on, on things, but like you see these snapshots of wonderful, interactions, right? And then I work with children in care. And then you have a cumulative chronic still pain care. You have wonderful interactions, but you have so many bad moments. And uh, when we know that we have this very, very sensitive space of three years, how do you see your approach actually helping to make the decision of when to leave, well enough alone, and what is well enough and when to actually exist? Two things, I love what you say. Two things. I'm certainly a proponent of support of good enough mothering. <laughs> good enough uh, to use Winnicott's great case. You, you don't have to be a super mom or dad. You make mistakes. Uh, my colleague Ed Tronic has done a lot of research with face to face interactions and finds out that actually the most, a huge percentage of these interactions are actually missteps. So, and I, I think that the one thing, babies are forgiving. They want the thing to work. So we make mistakes and we come back and we try to remedy it. And the thing is, I think in these off uh, interactions, we went, oh God, I realized that wasn't, I, I've been doing my grandchild all the time. I should know better, but realizing I'm dying to interact with him. And he said to me, oh, then uh, just move away, please. I want time out. <laughs> but I'm so eager. And the fact is trying to read these signs. But the good thing is, hopefully, he'll forgive me. And, I know he may, and I'll come back and the right is, ah, that's the right time. And he can tell me. But yes, and of course, prolonged 
negative direction, there, there's just much harder to remedy. You're, you're so right. I mean, there's no easy fix for this. It's such a complex thing. And what the representations people bring from their own history, there are ghosts in everybody's nursery, as Selma Freiberg said. We all bring ghosts with us. So it is a complex therapeutic challenge. And this is just one aspect of the cure. And I've said perhaps the most underrated one would be the role of the baby or the child over these months in being the cure in, if you like, facilitating optimal uh, interaction.